Facebook, but no, oh, well, here we go. Here we are. Okay. Here we are. You guys are up. I'm not. Every week and every week. Same thing again. Yeah. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> you can never get it always right. Every part. Uh, all right. The yeah, Sunday okay. night jam. <laughs> <laughs> and we're live. Yeah. That's what happens. Uh, okay. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, welcome back to our Sunday night offering of Astronomy Outreach, the Sunday night astronomy <laughs> show. Yay. Yay. It's us. Hello? Oh, yeah, I'm just fixing oh. the camera. Okay, there you go. There we uh, go. There we go. Hey, my name is Chris Kerwin of Astronomy by the Bay, and first of all, I'd like to welcome back our regular co-host, Mr. Paul Owen from Moonshadow Observatory in beautiful Hampton, New Brunswick. Hello. Evening. Evening. And also, we got Mr. Mike Powell from the PFO Observatory here in St. John, New Brunswick. Welcome Howdy. Mike. Howdy. Howdy. <laughs> this way. You guys are both this way to me. Number one. Yeah, need to have a price oh, tag. Yeah. Need a price tag hanging off my hat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's get started. Uh, on tonight's episode of the Sunday Night Astronomy Show, um, while warm, clear August evenings like we have tonight uh, present the perfect opportunity to step outside and gaze at our corner of the universe, the magnificent beauty of our own Milky Way. It can be both a rewarding and a humbling experience, but how we... Uh, how do we best capture those moments so that we can share them with others later on or enjoy them ourselves on those cloudy nights that we get just occasionally, those one once in a lifetime. Yeah. Anyway, uh, tonight then we're going to take a look at uh, how to provide those answers to you uh, and along with uh, where to be and what to look for underneath the evening sky. Uh, we'll look at what it takes to capture those special Milky Way photos. Uh, we're going to look at the camera types and types of settings and mounts and how to process your, what? Uh, I should go over here. <laughs> am, I, am I creeping over the side too far? Just a little bit. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, how to uh, capture and process that data. Also tonight, we got a Bino Bud. A Bino so Bud's going to be back with another binocular target. Slinking. Uh, this time glancing back at the double cluster. Uh, and Paul's going to return with another interesting Rosanna's Fun Facts tonight. And, of course, we'll have all your wonderful photo submissions to share. So sit back, folks, and uh, grab your favorite beverage and uh, your snack. I don't get no snacks, but uh, enjoy. There you go. And Are you remember, doing your James Taylor impression? Why is that? The hat? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, no. I've, I've been told that I should start wearing one of these peak caps because I'm getting older. So, <clears throat> Oh, I don't mind it. Um, remember that was this badges and bud badges and stuff on it. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, anyway, this is a family friendly live broadcast, isn't it, guys? Yep. <laughs> so, if you have so, any, yeah. <laughs> so if you have any questions about the night sky, we're more than happy to try to answer them here for you. Uh, so let's get started then again with tonight's program. <laughs> uh, are you looking to do a Sunday night show? <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> You're looking for a husband? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, <man>. oh, wait. <laughs> I don't think we're out underneath the stars enough, guys. I think that's what it is. No, we just I think that's one, one we're losing so our and... starlight sense, right? We are, yeah. We're losing our sense completely, I think. But anyway, uh, Clayton says, hey, hello, guys. Did you catch those clear skies last evening? Um, 
Last, last evening. I don't I remember last some, night. I don't remember last night. Last night? Two nights ago. Friday Two night. Two nights ago. Free night. Yeah. Friday night. Yeah. Yes. I would, uh, I would, yeah. It was, I was there. it was awesome. Uh, I was at yeah. the beach and I caught, uh, I think, six meteors all together. <clears throat> the sky is not, you know, the very best from the beach, but, uh, and then, I'll, then the fog started rolling in. And when you left, Mike, the fog got even a lot worse, a lot faster. They just, it just rolled right around us then. So, wow. It looked straight up. That's, why, that's why I left. <laughs> yeah, that's why you left. See, you bring the sunshine or the clear sky. Uh, the fog and beach. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> tis what it is. Good evening, everybody. For uh, Thanks for joining us. Um, I think you're going to need to get back to the beach. Uh, an outreach. You're right, Trudy. This is the only outreach I know at the moment, so <laughs> it's not really working for me. I need to get back to the personal. And I, I miss it so bad. I do miss the in-person outreach really bad. Like I can't wait that we can get back with this, get this thing behind us, and and uh, be able to offer it safe. I mean, we we visited, visited the beach uh, on Friday night. There were a few people that dropped by, um, and we were masking up and you know wiping down things as we needed to. But uh, that's what it'll be for the next little while until we can actually get out and. Until we get this behind us and the Delta variants behind us, and we're you know we may be spring before all that happens, but we'll continue to, to offer what we can for now. At least we've got this show to keep us tidying over until we can go back to the in-person stuff. So looking forward to, keep to us it. Sane. Keep us sane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, let's get uh, breaking up badly on Facebook. She says, "Are you up on YouTube?" Yes, I am. Um, breaking up badly on Facebook. I wonder why. How's it looking on your Facebook, Mike? My Facebook looks clear and maybe, steady. Maybe the volume is bad. Just uh, I'll close my door here just a second. That might help. I did have a fan there kind of cool me off, but I'll be okay. Okay, let's get started with uh, with some information on how to <coughs> shoot the Milky Way, Paul. Oh, tis you're long. Point, you're pointing at camera. Yeah. <laughs> the star. The <laughs> click. The click. <laughs> Go okay. click, go click, click. <laughs> click, 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 click. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. So tonight uh, we decided last week about this week, and uh, last week we decided that uh, this week we actually, by the time we're done our show, and it's actually getting dark out, uh, the Milky Way will be just about prime, just about right overhead. Uh, right around 9 30 10 o'clock i think is what we worked it out to yeah and uh so all of these nice in fact uh, uh mike i think you just showed me a picture that you took from st Therese beach could you show that picture hey, bring it up right now yeah and chris if you could pin mike um, on that one it should be should be up there there it is oh yeah no that's that's yes that's st Therese, hey eh? yeah that's st Therese. That old fun to be with all the boats. Wow, a lot of boats, eh? Hey? Uh, it's not down from the beach. I was up on the hill and kind of went up over the knoll to take that shot. So it's a little oh, higher. Okay, yeah. In the same area. Yep, good. So basically, what you're seeing there is what you'll see tonight, right around 9 30, 10 o'clock when you go outside. It's going to be very, very close to uh, standing straight up. And when it stands straight up, it is, if you're looking south, you're looking into the galactic core of the Milky Way. And if you spin right around 180 degrees, you're going to be looking at Polaris. And uh, that's the cool thing about the Milky Way being straight up and down. Uh, first of all, when you want to use it for taking uh, photographs of it, um, it's really easy to find some kind of a foreground that you can have this shooting up out of uh, rather than off to the side and, you know, that kind of stuff. Because if you're trying to shoot the Milky Way off to the side, it's a little bit more, um, you got to really pick your poison when you're looking for a foreground. But when I'm shooting Milky Way like this, I think I shot one in St. Martin's last year when, when, or two years ago when Chris and uh, Mike and I were up there. And I had it coming right out of a basketball net. You know, so you can do some pretty cool things when the Milky Way is straight up like that. Um, so that's, that's actually a very, very nice way to see it. Um, now, the one that you see behind me on my screen, and I'll just pin myself. And keep the and keep that up or keep oh, it up. Okay. Further, right? yeah, just keep it because we're going to talk a little bit about that too, a little bit a little bit further. But the Milky Way that you see behind mm -hmm. me. Um, just a sec, Paul. I'm going to get us back to his tiled screen here. Yeah. Um, change layout. And I just want to show you the Milky Way behind me. That's all. Okay. And it's is it backwards or is it the, it's probably the right way behind you? You're seeing it the right way. I'm seeing it backwards. Yeah. 
Okay, so the Milky Way that's behind me, if I pull off to the side, uh, was taken um, um, a little while ago, and this was around 11.30 at night, and it's coming up on an angle. Uh, and the reason being is because um, er as the season starts into the summer, the Milky Way comes up, but when, by the time that we see it, 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 doesn't, it, it only rises up into the eastern sky, and maybe to get close to the middle by the time you peak at night before it actually starts to get daylight again. But if you take um, this time of year now, the, you know, the, the middle of August on through till probably the first couple of weeks in September, the, uh, the early time of night that everybody's still awake and not doing things, the Milky Way will be nice and straight straight up. So so there's, just to give you an idea, I'm trying to get out of the way of my picture, there we go. So you can see the angle that this Milky Way is coming up, right? And that was about uh, 11 o'clock at night, 11 or 11.30. So it was just starting to come up then, but again, so with Mike's photograph, uh, it's coming straight up, which is which is really ideally where you want it for the best um, the best imagery for a lot of reasons. If you're looking for and I'll just unpin myself again here. Well, if you're looking for the galactic core, uh, which is where um, the most um, colorful and dynamic part of the Milky Way is, if you can get it coming up due south this time of year. You're going to get your if if it's the Milky Way that you want to be the most dominant thing in the photograph. This is the time of year to get it. Um, so it's straight up, and you can look right into the into the galactic core, and it's as high as it's going to be throughout the night, because as it comes up in the east, <clears throat> it's tilted like this, and then as the night goes on, it starts to straighten itself up. When it straightens itself up from the bottom of the Milky Way straight up is as high as that galactic core is going to rise. And then as it crosses the, 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 the southern line, the meridian, as it crosses that, then it starts tilting over, kind of like the Milky Way behind me is now, except backwards, of course. It'll start to tilt. And when it, when it does that, as it starts to drop in uh, further into the, um, into the horizon as it gets later at night, well, then you're getting back into atmospheric issues and you know your foregrounds have to be specific and so on and so forth. So the best way to shoot it, if you can, is uh, is straight up. Unless you've got a very specific spot. Uh, there's a guy in Nova Scotia, actually a guy and a gal in Nova Scotia who shot some. They got a special place. I think it's down the north, the southern shore, and they've got these really cool rocks over the ocean, and they're they're like an arch, and they're able to get the Milky Way in the form of the arch, basically from the southern tip of it to the northern tip using a very wide uh angle lens but they're getting it on a on a curve and it's absolutely stunning cool. to look at it that way but you got to have the right foreground but for people who are out there they're just taking shots of it just getting used to it um this time of year is a good time it's it's easy at night it's not late and um and you're going to get your best your best view of it this time of year so so that's enough about the view of it so when we shoot the milky way there's three things to consider uh the first one is um <clears throat> excuse me uh, where you're going to take the picture. And what I mean by that is, uh, first of all, um, are, are you going to take it just the Milky Way with no foreground? Or if you want a foreground, you kind of need to kind of plan where you want to go and take that picture. And on top of all of that, don't go uptown and looking for a great spot that, oh, I'll get the Milky Way coming up over top of City Hall because you're not going to get the Milky Way. It's going to be too darn bright. When you shoot the Milky Way, it's got to be in a dark, dark sky. Now, the photograph that Mike showed you, or that's still on the screen, is in a Bortle Class 5, did you say, Mike? Yes. So it's a Bortle Class 5 sky. So as, as nice as that Milky Way shot is, it's, even with the best of processing, it's not going to get that much nicer. Because the, the, the Milky Way in the sky, the sky itself is too bright. So it's going to be very hard to separate all that light and noise and stuff from the Milky Way in that kind of a sky you'll be spending a lot of time and if you're not a good processor you'll probably just get frustrated and say oh, i just can't do this so because there's you, because when you're pre processing anything there's if they have the best of conditions is the very best thing that you can do for yourself especially if you're um not that great at processing yet or you're just starting into it um the sky that you see behind me was taking in a class board i guess mike and i worked it out here a minute ago somewhere's a three i thought it was a two but it's a three Order class three sky, 
but you can see the difference in the Milky Way here, how much more um, separation there is between the, the, the black part of the Milky Way and then how little of that yellow brownish glow that you get from light pollution because where I was at, it wasn't much of it except for that green cast that you see down on the bottom. That green cast you see in the bottom was actually um, uh, somebody was having a party and there was a bunch of lights on and anyway, I couldn't get away from it. So <laughs> I just shot, I shot the picture anyway. But in any event, with that kind of a sky, um, even a Bortle class three is gonna give you a much stronger uh, uh, image to work with to begin with because you've got you've got more darkness and you've got more starlight as opposed to starlight trying to fight through light pollution and that kind of stuff. So the things to consider um, when you're um, going to go shoot the Milky Way is get out to the darkest sky that you can get out to. If you're going to shoot near a beach or a place like that or a place that may be hard to navigate at night, go in the daytime and have a look around and you know be, get familiar with where you're going and then, uh, then go back there and shoot that. Uh, and there's also some software that you can uh, you can download. I've got one program, and I'll look for it while we while I'm chatting with you. And what it does, it actually shows you um, what the uh, sky darkness is uh, anywhere that you want to find it. And uh, it's called the Light Pollution Map (LPM). And uh, I'll see if it's going to come up here, and I'll see if I can see, you can see it on my screen. I don't think it's going to show it. Yeah, if, if somebody can just Google it and bring it up there. Yeah, yeah, it's called light pollution map. And you see those areas that Mike's showing there now where they are red and yellow, that's light pollution. And as you get into the green, it starts to get a little bit better. As you get into that turquoise color, it's better again. And, yeah, then, yeah. and then when you get into that deep blue, it's good. But when you get into that black, that's that's a true... I think that's, is that Mount Carlton, Mike? That's Mount Carlton, Bortle 1, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a Bortle 1 sky. That sky is so dark. When you look up night at night, and if there's clouds up there, they'll look like black holes in the sky uh, because there's no light reflecting from the ground to light the cloud up. So it's just black. That's how dark those skies are. Those are the places, if you can get to, you want to take some extremely nice Milky Way shots, those are the, those are the places to go to. And but if you look yeah. at that map, it's called the light pollution map. That is, uh, that's your best friend when you're, if you're in New Brunswick or wherever you are in the world, just type in your location and then you can just have a look around and how far do I have to drive to get to whatever class sky that I think will be sufficient. If, if, if you can go to get to a Bortle 3 even, that's a good sky to, you know, to, to start with the Milky Way. But 2 or 1 is definitely the best way to go if you can get to them, so. So that's basically um, that part of it. So uh, be aware of where you're going and what your sky conditions are going to be like. But the second thing is the acquisition. Now the acquisition is, or is, um, uh, is in part um, what you have to do for your settings on your camera, but also your equipment. Now I'm just going to, I've got something here. I'm going to just do a, just a quick rundown and people who've seen it went around me long enough will have seen this before. But I want to show it. I just got to find it. And I'm going to share my screen and hopefully you'll go to the right screen here. And let's go to entire screen. Uh oh, oh, the PFO. I, Mike, can I get you stop sharing? Yeah. It's all yours. Thank you, sir. Don't call me, sir. I work for a living. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where am I going? I'm going over here. That's the one I want. Hold on, me, Joe. And I'm going to go to slideshow, start from current, and then tell me what you see, if it, if it, if it all worked out. Did we make it? Let's see uh, the moon. Just see the moon, Paul. In your okay. desktop. There it okay. is. Okay, so hang on. So Let me start, start, Does it say starting with camera in the lens? Yeah, it's flashing back and forth. Yeah, I just did that for a second. Sorry. Is it okay now? No. Uh, it's still jumping back and forth. Okay, how about now? That's steady. Okay, good. Do you want right, me to pin so, that, Paul? Uh, yeah, sure. Case yeah, because I can't see me anyway, so all I see is this. So. Okay, so basically for taking uh, Milky Way shots or moon shots or whatever the case being, um, what you require is a DSLR. And the DSLR is probably the most popular thing for a number of reasons. <clears throat> it requires no computer. You have to take a computer with you. It can operate with battery. So, again, you don't have to drink big, those great big marine batteries with you. You can use a variety of lenses. They have all different kind of focal lengths you can use. 
Uh, you can uh, adapt for a prime focus. So if you want to stick it in a telescope, you can do that too. Um, uh, can mount on tripods for long exposures. Has the most built-in flexibility, is most portable because uh, you can carry it in a backpack. So you can take this in a tripod and then go, it's like a little pack that you would use if you're going hiking. So it's very, very portable and easy to take along with you. In fact, this is from Sky and, Tele from Sky and Telescope Magazine. And, and this is what they wrote. And I found this very powerful because it's so true. There's no question that digital single lens reflex cameras, DSLRs, and mirrorless cameras are the most versatile cameras available today. No other device can go from shooting your children's birthday party in the backyard to recording distant galaxies through a telescope without needing any modifications. DSLRs uh, have truly thrust open the door of astrophotography to anyone with an interest in shooting the night sky. And I thought that was so bang on, so on point. So I just, I, I had to put that in my, uh, my little presentation. So what do you need? So what you need is a camera. You need uh, memory, which is that one down here uh, in the corner. I get my mouse working. There we go. Uh, you need, of course, uh, a remote shutter, um, uh, a remote uh, uh, shutter release, uh, a tripod, and make sure you got lots of batteries. And what I don't have in this picture, uh, and it's very important, is some kind of dew control. And um, I'll get Mike to talk about that a little bit later when he does this, this little part of it. So, so you're going to need those things um, to basically take shots of the Milky Way. And so the camera itself, again, we talked about that. Um, it's a DSLR. I, I, years ago, when this camera was out, when the T3i was actually a new camera, these were one of the best cameras that were out there for low noise uh, or low light uh, noise control. And so Canon were actually leading the line when it comes to that kind of a thing. But sensors today um, and brand now, uh, you can go basically any brand you want to because all cameras now have really gotten good, good uh, low light sensitivity from their sensors because even daytime photographers shooting in dark scenes were, were actually requiring it. So, so many, many manufacturers have been building cameras for decades and have established themselves. So, and I just listed a bunch of the names that are on there and the names of course there's more than that but those are the more common ones that are out there so here's a shocker folks you do not need high-end cameras and lenses to photograph the <laughs> <night sky. laughs> how'd you get my photo that was mine that's mine that's me in the mirror in the morning, the morning. <laughs> you didn't know I was yeah. <laughs> where's my hat i don't see my hat <laughs> That was got, me at work today. <laughs> He's got more hair than I got. There you go. Me too. So, so yeah. So you do not need high-end cameras and lenses to photograph the night sky. So um, a modest camera with a flexible manual control can yield excellent results. Now, this lady here, she, she's just taking a picture of a, of a sunrise, which is actually very dark. Um, and, but in any event, she just had one of those... Um, um, uh, hybrid cameras, <clears throat> which are sort of, you can't change the lens, but they've got a lot of really cool manual uh, control in them. So, so a decent little camera for doing that kind of work. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm not going to get into a lot of this because this, this is a full presentation. I just want to touch on the things. So I'm not going to get into the camera sensor sizes and all that stuff in comparisons. So you need a solid tripod. Um, if you have a tripod now, and it's a little bit of a lightweight tripod. You can actually uh, just bring along a, like a plastic bag with you. And then when you get to the site that you're at, take that bag and basically just affix it to the camera. Usually these things will have a little hook on them or something like that. And um, just affix the bag to that and start filling it up with rocks. And when you do that, that'll actually uh, take your tripod and it'll actually force it into the ground. And it'll make it a lot more sturdy so that if, as you're taking your shots, if the wind comes up or something like that, you're not going to get that, you know, the, the, the camera shaking or anything like that. So um, also you're going to need a remote shutter release or you can use your camera self timer. So if you don't have a remote shutter release, um, there's a number of things you can do. Um, yeah, you can use your camera self timer. That's good for up to about 30 seconds. If you're on a static tripod, and I don't care what lens you have, you're not going to get any more than 30 seconds anyway. So you can actually set your camera's uh, remote timer, and it can do a 30-second shot. You can even do them in succession. So you can actually put it on continuous shoot, 
it'll take a 30 second, it'll take another 30 second, it'll take another 30 second. The nice thing about having the sh remote shutter release is you can actually give it a command to wait between shots so that it can actually get downloaded onto your memory card uh, comfortably. So, but if you got a fast card, um, you, you know, that, that'll, that'll go a long way if you don't have a remote shutter release. And the other thing for this, of course, and the main thing for doing this is so you're not going to, you're not going to vibrate your camera. When you push the shutter release, you don't want to shake the camera. Um, know your SD card specs. I, I won't get into that a lot other, th other than to say that when you choose your, um, your SD cards, try to make sure that you're getting something that's high speed. Uh, you know, that's in a, like a UHS-2, something along those lines. Um, you want your information to be read from your sensor and transferred to your card as quickly as possible. The faster it is, the better. Um, if you're taking successful shots, that kind of thing. If you're just taking a shot and then looking around, taking another shot, it won't matter all that much. But at the same time, uh, capacity is very important. So make sure that if you're going out and you only have one memory card in your camera, make sure that you don't have a bunch of family photos you're going to have to delete to make space to take pictures of the Milky Way because you don't have room left on your card. So make sure you've got ample room on your card if you only have one. My recommendation is, is to buy an SD card specifically for your nighttime photography and have another one for your daytime stuff. Um, classifications, again, I'm not going to get into that. Um, lenses, so there's telephoto lenses, there's wide angle lenses, there's macro, there's converters, there's all, all, all teleconverters, which will actually take a lens and increase its focal length, magnify. Um, so, but for Milky Way shots, which is what we're talking about tonight, you want to use the widest angle lens you have. If you only have a kit lens, which is the lens that, that usually comes with a DSLR, which is usually an 18 to 55, You've got a wide enough angle lens on your camera that'll do a, a, a good job in capturing a wide swath of the Milky Way. So don't worry about using telephotos. That's not what you want. You don't want a long lens for Milky Way unless you're going for very specific features within the Milky Way. Then a long lens is not a bad thing. And also a wide lens is very forgiving on time. The wider your lens, the longer you can leave it open on a static tripod before you get the star trails. Just to give you an idea on focal length on, on uh, some of these lenses, if you had a 100 millimeter lens shooting the moon, that's what it would look like in comparison to an 800 millimeter lens. So you can see that um, when you choose your lens, the wider the better. Even this 100 millimeters is too wide for the Milky Way because you would only see a very small part of the Milky Way in a 100 millimeter lens. A 14 millimeter lens, now we're talking. <laughs> There's the moon in a 14 millimeter lens, but look at all the space all around it. And that's what you want because the Milky Way covers the sky and trust me, it will be much larger or longer than a 14 millimeter lens will capture. So a 14 millimeter is excellent up to about, um, you know, 25, even 30, you can get a pretty good picture of the Milky Way. Anything above that, then you're gonna start getting just basically portions of the Milky Way. I'm gonna scan all through this. I don't know that there's anything else I want to show you here. No, I think that is pretty much it. So I'm going to stop this slide and I'm going to stop presenting. So, um, so, so that's that. Now, uh, so now we've talked about um, uh, the darkness of the sky and the preparation, planning. We talked about acquisition, the kind of stuff that you need. We didn't get into settings for, for Milky Way. I'll, I'll tell you this. If you have a DSLR camera, you're going to go to manual. You're going to take your lens in the camera itself. It's going to go to manual. You're going to turn off the stabilization on your lens if you have it because it's sitting on a, a static tripod. It's designed to, because when, you, when your hands are shaking, when you take a picture, it's designed to stabilize. But when it's on a pod, a lot of those um, stabilization motors are still moving because it's trying to, to mitigate something that's not there. So you still may get movement. So shut off your stabilization, manual lens, manual setting, uh, ISO. Uh, if you can get up to 3200, go there. Um, as far as shutter speed, um, there's, there's what they call the 500 rule, which I don't think applies anymore today. I would more be more accurate with a 300 rule. 
and that's where you just take basically 300 divided by the length of your lens and that'll give you an idea of how many seconds you can leave your shutter uh, open on your picture before the stars actually start to trail because there is sky movement the, the, the sky isn't moving we are but we seem to think the sky is moving because that's how we see it so the sky moves and because uh, a camera is sitting uh, uh, static on a on a on a fixed a point the sky is actually moving well you can only have that sky move so long before those pinpoint stars you see behind me start to look like streaks you don't want that in the milky way shot so um so the, the rule of thumb for most lenses is anywhere say between 10 to 20 seconds and anywhere's in there so you know start with a 20 second shot if you take the picture do a test shot look at it and if it's uh, got round stars go to 25. If you get some streaking then, then go back to 20 and be happy with 20, especially if you're using your uh, self timer on your camera because it only goes in five second increments. So if so, so do that in the five second increment. If you've got a, a remote release, you can do whatever you want because you put it in bulb, you tell it how long you want it to be open. So if you can get the 23 seconds, you can do that if you have a bulb or a, a remote release and a bulb setting on your camera. But if you don't, then use the five, uh, five second. Uh, incremental rule. Um, so yeah, so you're, so you're going to set that up to that, and then your um, so that's your shutter speed. We cover. Oh, and your uh, aperture. Uh, open it up as wide as you can. So if you've got a 3.5 um, uh, uh, f-stop on that kit lens, put it to 3.5. The reason being is you want to open that aperture as much as you can because you're gathering light so quickly because 15 seconds is not a long time for something in the dark. Like that to get a to, you know to get a picture. So so open up the aperture as wide as you can. Um, your shutter speed should be between 10 and 20 seconds. You can see you can do it after a couple of test shots. Figure that out. And then if you can get up to 3200 uh, ISO, go there. If you only have an old camera and only goes to 1600, so be it. Go to 1600. I wouldn't go beyond 3200 really <clears throat> because you're going to start getting into some noise and that kind of stuff. So th those would be settings I would recommend. The only other thing that you need to know is focusing. Um, so my recommendation to you would be um, in the daytime before you shoot the Milky Way, find a point that's far, far, far away, like a tree line that's way, way, way away. Take your camera, focus on that far, far away tree line and get those trees as crisp and sharp as possible. Then take a piece of tape and then tape that on there. Take another test shot, make sure that by putting the tape on, you haven't moved the lens. And if you've got that, then you're good for the night. You don't have to worry about focus anymore. So that would be my recommendation for that. So that would be uh, camera settings, and that would be technique, um, and then uh, oh, and the do. So if it starts to do up, I'm going to let Mike talk about some do do control stuff. So that's my condensed version of shooting the Milky Way between planning, acquisition, and uh, and getting your image, and then of course then there's processing, which is a whole other kettle of fish, but if you get it into your camera, we can talk processing another time. There you go. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Paul. That okay. is a lot. That is a lot to condense in a short time for sure. There's so much there. <laughs> um, Mike, you want to talk a little bit about uh do well, speaking control? of condensing, when you get out there yeah. at night. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got a telescope or a camera, eventually the uh, the moist air is gonna condense on your lens and of course you're gonna do up. I know that night that we were down in St. Martin's last year, the three of us. My camera dewed up in a matter of like seconds. It felt like I, I put the lens on and whoo, it was done. Yep. So, I mean, there's there's all kinds of things you can do out there. People have tried, you know, hand warmers and things like that. And people have, uh, you know, taken the big 12 volt batteries down and hooked their telescope uh, dew heaters to to their lenses and stuff. The one thing I came across, and and I'll, I you know, I'd love to get an ownership in it because I'll sell them for sure. <laughs> I went on eBay and I found this, and it's actually. A coffee cup warmer and that is a size that'll fit just about any lens it's five volt because it's USB powered coffee cup warmer now the neat thing about this one is you can plug it into those chargeable battery packs you get for your phone to recharge your phone and stuff like that and it'll probably run all night but this one here also has a rheostat on it so you can actually set the temperature to you know you don't have to keep it on all night you can set it for a certain temperature and it will shut off and turn back on or shut off and turn back on and 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 hold that for you and they run about 10 bucks a piece on, on ebay for you know if, uh, what's a 
telescope do strap right here? hundred dollars for an eight inch. Yeah. 70, 80 bucks for a, something that's a, say a 90 millimeter. This thing here will fit. Well, I've got it shrink down, but here's a full size. That will fit a four inch scope. If you wanted to put it on there and run it off five volts, but it definitely will wrap around any camera lens that, that you would have. The other part, like Paul said, if you set your focus, you want to tape it, this will wrap around so you don't end up grabbing that part of your focuser and moving it. It's, it kind of gets in the way, so that it will help you know hold your focus all night as well. But uh, if you're out there and you want to get rid of do, that's uh, that's something you want to look for. Like I said, they're on eBay. They're about ten bucks a piece, and they are a five or a USB coffee cup warmer is what they were actually listed as. So, and they work. It works. It keeps the the do off really really well. Great idea, like you said, not just for cameras, but for, for scopes as well. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, I mean, when you're buying a Dew controller and the heaters, you're in there a couple of hundred bucks normally. Yeah, and you're running it on 12 volts, and your mount's running on 12 volts, and everything's running on 12 volts. This, a little piece of Velcro, you stick one of those little recharger battery packs on, you plug into your, you know, five-volt battery pack, and away you go. It's yeah. completely separate from the rest of your system as well. Right, exactly, yeah. It's an awesome system. Like it. Like it now about mounts. We did talk a little bit about mounts, like well, shooting with camera. You're just going to use your, like your tripod and having it solid is the biggest part about it. But um, you were you uh, you have a sky, a sky tracker though, too, Paul, right? So yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's that's, um, yeah. yeah uh, the advantage of a of a sky uh, sky tracking device. Uh, oh, it's right here. I'll just slide I'm just, over. I'm just going to mention to folks out there that we may be running a little long tonight with the, with the show, folks, because I do have a number of photos here to share that we want to get to, and we know that we're running a little bit long on our topic. Yeah. But I'm not um, going to. No, no. But just mentioning that you know we may be a little long, maybe 50 minutes long. So if you don't mind, we're we're trying to get into a topic here that we wanted to cover tonight. So if you stay uh, with us, great. And if you can, that's that's excellent. So there. Um, I'll just show you what that tracking device is. That's all. I got a camera right on it. That's the camera will stay there. There. Yeah, so all that is, instead of just using a static tripod, all it does is at night, um, as, this, as the sky rotates, it's got a motor built into it. So let's say you start your picture here, and the sky is moving. And all it does is just, as the sky moves, it's got a motor that will synchronize with the speed of the sky. You're just going to do what they call a polar line. And, the, and, of course, the advantage to this is um, you can take much, much longer uh, subframes. And because you can take longer subframes, um, you don't have to take as many, which is actually, it's, it sounds like, well, it's longer frames, it's going to take more memory. In fact, it takes a lot less memory, because if I can get, say, 10 uh, two-minute images, as opposed to um, however many that it would be if, if there were 30 seconds, uh, you know, 30 or 40, it, the camera doesn't care how long the lens was open. The camera says, okay, here's your picture. It was a raw image. Here's the, here's the size of it, and this is how much it, it, it is. So by taking longer images, you actually take less memory. Okay, awesome, yeah. I have a, I have a MacGyver version of the same thing. Basically, it's, a, it's an EQ23 mount with a digital uh, Celestron log, uh, logis, or logic drive, and it does the exact same thing. I mounted a ball mount on the top, and then this will rotate with, with the, you know, the night sky. And just, it allows me to take, well, I was taking one minute images, but no blurs. So I was happy with that. If I can get one image uh, or one minute shot, <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah. It makes a difference. It really does. Oh yeah. All the difference in the world. And we squeezed in a Mike Giver segment. So there. Awesome. Ta -da. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about Mike Giver. It's all about, I mean, those, those do controllers. <laughs> the do controllers allow you to spend your money on other stuff, right? Like if you can get something cheaper like that, that works well. And I remember yeah. seeing them, Mike, I, I bought one myself too. I think it was off eBay. Um, somebody had them up there and yeah, I think you showed me one at the beach and I, I went in and bought one. It was worked excellent for the small little 72 millimeter refractor scope. I tried it on it and it worked perfect. Yeah. Yeah, so We're actually we're, selling them now as do protection for, for small scopes. Are they? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So. Yeah. They do. They do. They do. <laughs> they, they do the job. Huh? Yes, indeedy, doody. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, there you go, folks. That's what we can talk about for the Milky Way. If you want to, if you go out practicing, like we got a nice night tonight. Tomorrow night's supposed to be nice, I guess, right up till Tuesday night. I think it's going to be, and then maybe a day of rain, but a few more days. So we're getting into the later part of August now, which usually means for us that um, leading into the end of August and into the first of September, it's usually you know better, much better viewing. 
um, more clear nights and, and of course the sky is getting darker earlier already so so if you have any photos like that that you want to share with us send them into our, our Facebook page or into uh, the Sunday Night Astronomy Show um, address that I'll give you a little bit later and we'd love to see your photos and see what you're able to capture so all right sounds great yeah thanks thanks guys Ta-da. okay let's yeah. uh, so let's go from there to um, how about a bino bud on a bino bud here he comes if, uh, one here. second before we get away I did have one question here um, Kathy Keith asked uh, <clears throat> Paul I think is that a single shot or stacked I believe that one behind you that you had is the of the Milky Way oh that was a stack of um, uh, 10 30 second shots okay yeah I just want to be sure that there's no other questions Mike I'll get you to get that ready but I'll, I'll check on sure. questions here too uh, but yeah folks if you have any questions go ahead and post them I'm watching here on both uh, feeds to see if there's any coming in Uh, there's a connector at Canadian Tire. David Smart says that you could connect multiple cables with. So there you go. Um, I know that some of the battery banks, too, that you can buy at Canadian Tire now have two plugs in them, <coughs> have two 5-volt USB outlets. So yeah. you can actually run. You could run your, your dew heater on your scope and your one, say, for your eyepiece at the same time off a little 5-volt pack and mount that on the side of your scope. It's out of your way. And so, yeah, I think you'll see these take off quite a bit when people start to learn that they're out there. And for the price, for sure. Yeah. Okay. All right, Mike, whenever you're ready. And we should have a bud. We do. We do. So, binocular tiger of the week. I buy no bud this week is. Oh, a second, got a pin in the other. Here we go. The double cluster. <laughs> <laughs> NGC 8969 and NGC 88. Four, uh, eight, eight sixty nine and eight eighty four. Hmm. Anyway, the double cluster, also known as Caldwell fourteen, consists of the open clusters NGC eight sixty nine and NGC eight eight four, which are close together in the constellation Perseus. Both are visible with the naked eye. NGC eight six nine and NGC eight eight four lie at a distance of about seventy five hundred light years away. How do I find it in the night sky? Now, I've been doing everything around midnight, so if you went outside at midnight tonight, which I, probably in the future I might be able to start cutting it back to 11 o'clock, but right now, if you walked outside at midnight and oriented yourself to 35 degrees north, northeast, and looked up, you can always find Cassiopeia, the W in Cassiopeia. You follow that W straight down towards Perseus, and you will hit the double cluster. There's going to be no question about it. You'll know it when your binoculars come across it. There, if you look at this W of Cassiopeia, now this one's upside down, but you get the gist of it. Cassiopeia, you come off that line straight down, <coughs> excuse me, and you hit the double cluster. Or uh, the Cassiopeia the Queen from Nubi straight down this way, and again, you hit the double cluster. What will you see? Basically, this is a, a good version of what you'll see. Those two clusters are so close together, and they stand out against all the background. 10 by 50 binoculars. This will be your view. And compared to the full moon, this will be your view. So it's a pretty big size. Bigger than the full moon. And... <laughs> <laughs> Take your mic spray because that's our bino tag of the week by bino bud. Uh, awesome. Uh, uh, there you go. Nice and quick. That was, that was yeah. The yeah. night that I was doing the Milky Way, that's what it was like. Yeah. <laughs> Thermocell, guys. Thermocell. <laughs> Oh, they, they work excellent. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that is an awesome target for binoculars. Um, it's easy to spot. I mean, the naked eye at some place like Fundy National Park or Mount Carrollton for sure. Um, easy, easy. I mean, Andromeda is naked eye at Mount, uh, Mount Carrollton and so, at Fundy as well. But the double does stand right out at you if you're looking oh, at the right, right oh, underneath. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it. yeah, it's right there. So it's, it's easy to pick out. And it's a beautiful target in binoculars. It is. Yeah, it's and just nice and Find it. Don't forget, two weeks ago, you move a little bit to the left, and you'll find the strongman right beside it. There you go. Oh. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, uh, that's our Vino Bud talk. Um, we've got uh, a Rosanna talk, I guess, and then we've got uh, our photos and should be what we have for this evening, I guess. Uh, oh, 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 okay. <laughs> yeah, I think. <laughs> I, I pressed the wrong button. There. I do that all the time. I press wrong buttons all the time. Oh, that's the nature of what we do, eh? It is. Okay, let me just get this up and running here, and then we'll do Rosanna's fun fact. Okay, let me just put that over here. I'm going to share your screen. And I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to try to share my screen. And there it is. And share. And. Rosanna's Fun Fact. Awesome. Yay. Hey, thanks, Peter, for that again. Uh, yes. Well, hello, Rosanna. Thank you for this. Excellent fun fact we're about to uh, offer up. Uh, Rosanna's fun facts are always, in fact, fun, but they're also very, very informative. And sometimes I read stuff that she's uh, researching, and I'm thinking to myself, good golly, Miss Molly, am I ever a dumb guy? <laughs> but, anyway, <laughs> but I really like her, her, her fun fact for a blast. All right, so this week, she says, uh, Hi, Paul. Humans love to categorize, organize, and name things. We just can't help it. We are either in the green, yellow, orange, or red phase of the pandemic. It must be almost time for breakfast, lunch, or supper. We've organized the globe into time zones, a pattern of the stars into constellations, and so we have categorized star types. However, some things defy easy definition, so to borrow a phrase from Lisa Harvey Smith, welcome to the secret lives of stars. So let's examine Pobalski's star. Now, I'm just going to show you Pobalski star. Pronounce Prubalski, actually Prubalski is this fellow's name. Discovered in 1961 by Anton, Antoni uh, Prubalski. Technically, Prubalski star is an AP type star. The capital A means it's hotter than our sun, blue in color, and has a surface temperature of around 10,000 degrees Celsius. The P stands for peculiar. Yes, it surprised me too, but peculiar is an official astrophysics defining word. For ease of conversation, I'm going to call this star Prizzy. So this star, we're going to call it Prizzy. So now it sounds like we might have this star figured out, but wait, according to the paper I found on articles Harvard site, Prizzy star has quite the claim to fame. There's probably no other star whose spectral classification has caused as much confusion as eighth magnitude star HD 101065. Oh, goody. <laughs> Back in 1975, this article stated that Henry Draper catalog put Prissy down as a B5 star, but this was contradicted to the basis of its UBV colors. So it could be uh, a K0, but on the other hand, Cron and Gordon classified it as an F8. And finally, Wagner and Petford classified it as an F0. So I bet it's an amazing trip to its newest listing as an AP. I think P should be capitalized as peculiar as it is. Now, let me just, the next one. So, uh, so how so? By spreading out the light of a star into a rainbow, we can tell exactly what chemical elements are present. By further studying which colors have been lessened by the atoms in the cooler outer atmosphere, we can measure how much of each chemical is present. An accurate composition is found and stronger patterns occur in what we observe. But of course, Prizzy does not follow any previous patterns. The composition of the star is startling. It has far less iron and nickel than other stars of similar temperature and far more of the rare heavy elements, uh, strontium, neptunium, plutonium, curium, and einstein, if you can believe that's, that's a chemical. All of these are radioactive making prizzy, a hair raising environment. And um, let me see if I can pull this off. A hair raising environment. Oh, it's not gonna show up there. No, it won't let me show you. Sorry, I can't show that little MP4 clip. <laughs> All right. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so the most bizarre part, whoop, there we go. The most bizarre part of this is that many of these radioactive elements are short lived. If you put 100 uh, strontium atoms in a box and close the lid, open it and 28 years later, only 50 will remain. The others will have decayed into other chemicals. For curium, half of its atoms will decay in only 163 days. Uh, Einsteinium, 472 days. Prissy is millions of years old. So how do stro uh, st uh, strontium and curium get there and stay there? This is a mystery. This is why Scooby-Doo. <laughs> so another peculiarity is that how do the heavy radioactive elements get onto the outside of the star? This is working against gravity. Uh, strontium is 85, or sorry, 87 times heavier than hydrogen. So how come so much radioactive stuff is on Prizzy's surface? Another really cool, uh, or in this case, hot feature in Prizzy is a rapidly oscillating AP star, meaning that it breathes in and out every 12.15 minutes. Let me just... Um, although not fully understood yet, these pulsations seem driven by the strong magnetic fields of the star, dredging up hot material and heavy, heavy elements from the inside and covering the outer surface, not unlike a constant upset stomach of sorts. So Prissy star has 24 plus elements. It is no wonder it resists classifi uh, easy classification. In December 2018, Prissy made the number one spot on Buzz List, list of astronomically extreme types of stars, number one most unusual Prisbisky star, or Paul Bisky star, is definitely the winner of the category. And let me see if I can do this. And that is this week's. Rosanna's Fun Fact. Yay! <laughs> was an extremely great fun fact as you will thank you very much rosanna for that amazing information as always where does she come up with this stuff I don't know. it's amazing I don't know. i'm just glad she does oh yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, it's awesome information thanks so much rosanna again a lot of research yeah yeah it is a lot yeah. of research yeah she does a lot of work for that every week Okay, let's get to some photos, and then we're going to close out the show because we're uh, getting pretty close to time. We're at five minutes away, so hopefully I can squeeze as many in there here as I can. Yeah, it'll be good. Let's uh, yes, be okay. Yep. All right, tire screen. Uh, this one. And I want to go back to uh, full screen. I have to keep changing these menus down there. Um, okay, uh, let me get my photos out. Should be here. And I uh, just need my notes. Notes. Okay, here we go. Uh, open with photos. There, so hopefully we can see that popping up. Yep. Okay. So first up, we got uh, Stefan Picard sent this one in. He said, hi, Chris. Here's a 30-second exposure with my Canon T1i on my 6SE processed curved in Photoshop and slight color in Lightroom. I have several captures to stack, but the Triffid tri Nebula, have I got the right picture here? I think I do. So Stefan Picard. Yeah, it does. I want to be sure that I'm getting the right one though. I don't see the Triffid. Triffid yeah, you can see the lines just down at the bottom of it there. Okay. In that area, yeah. Yeah, uh, the Triffid Nebula is so bright you can see great details in one exposure. Hope to have a stacked version next week to compare. So we'll look forward to that one. Thank you, Stefan. Yes. I'm sure I get, I mean, I get so many in here, I just got to be sure they got them in the right order. So, and that's why I put the names up in the corner, <laughs> just in case. Um, we got this one from uh, Matthew Dupre. Uh, yeah. Well done. Just zoom in here a little bit. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah, nice uh, Matthew says, uh, North American Nebula. I got this uh, this week, he says, and the Veil and Pac-Man are some reprocessed images. Those are a couple coming up here in a second. Yeah, so, that's a Cygnus wall. That's uh, yeah. that's really, really nicely done. I don't know where that is, but <laughs> I keep hearing about it. Yes. Uh, yeah. And he's got this one. Nice Veil. 
Yeah. Yeah. Approval. Well done. That's the Easternville. Easternville. And we got this one. Pac-Man. Pac-Man. Nice. Yeah. Very nice. Awesome beer. Well done, Matthew. Thanks for sharing those. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, next up we've got uh, David McCashin. Uh, sent this one hey. in. Hey, hey, Dave. Heard that way in a while. I know. Yeah, we got to get Dave on the show. I keep trying to get him on to talk about his blogs, but he will eventually. We'll get Where him convinced. Go, Dave? Uh, so Dave said, uh, Ed O'Reilly and I get out on Friday night for the Perseids. As luck would have it, the fog seemed to go all around us, and we had almost three hours of almost perfectly clear dark skies out in Prince of Wales, which is a nice dark spot. Uh, we shared it with about a million mosquitoes, though, he says. <laughs> uh, between us facing in opposite directions, we got 34 Perseids, uh, 10 sporadics, and 4 unconfirmed. All in all, better than we expected by a long shot. Uh, he said, here are some images for your show. Dozens of my images to capture shooting stars were ruined from dew on my lens. <laughs> oh, wow. I, I said, he said, I forgot to check for that. Well, here's hoping that we can get back to normal observing with groups soon. I miss that as, as I'm sure all you guys do, so we do for sure. This one, yeah, is of uh, Jupiter and Saturn here. Jupiter down here, I believe, and Saturn's up here. Yeah. Um, he's got a nice shot of the moon. And Dave always puts his time like 21:57 hours. He puts right into the. <laughs> he's just he's so he's so uh, uh, detailed on his descriptions. Like if you went to read one of his blogs, you could sit there and just picture yourself standing right beside him. Because he describes the conditions of the sky, and uh, well, you never have to go out again. You just go by his, and yeah, he describes how <laughs> you're better than you're seeing it. That's right. <laughs> and he gave us this one with uh, the moon and Venus in the shot. So, yes, sir. Nice. Thanks, Dave, for those. Um, Gary White sent these two in. Gary uh, said he caught a couple of photos that he caught with his phone. Oh, cool. Yeah. Not bad. And the moon. Not bad. Oh, yeah. Not at all. Uh, Claude Edmund sent these ones. Thanks, Gary. Uh, Claude Edmund, uh, he said, I went out last night to try and capture some of the Percy meter shower. I guess this was uh, Friday night. Uh, lots of fog around St. John, he said. Had to go out to Bloomfield to get these ones. So these are the ones he captured with from Bloomfield. So he's wow. got some uh, really nice ones here. There we go. And there's a nice, oh, there's nice. nice fireball there one. Go. Yeah. Yeah. A couple in this shot. Well done. Right you might even have one in here, I think, as well. Fainter one. Yeah, faint one. So that must be. Is that the? Is that the northern part of the milk? I, I think it is. Yeah, that's northeast, I believe. There's well, there's Andromeda right there. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. 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 so we're. Yeah, I was looking right into per, looking right into Perseus and the double cluster in there. Yeah, I was just looking for Cassiopeia in the center. Because hmm. Cassiopeia would be pointing to Andromeda. Yeah. Yeah, it would be up here, right? Yeah. No, so, it'd be no, it'd be right in the Milky Way. So it'd be yeah, it's down. Yeah, yeah, right down there. Out there. Yeah. Okay, yeah, right. Oh, there's another one there. There's another one right beside Andromeda. Pretty, pretty cool when you get the Andromeda in the shot. With oh it. wow! You got a nice satellite in there, actually. I think that's a satellite shot. Well, satellite is it? Okay. Yeah, yeah it's not it is, that's right. That's right. It's not taped. Yeah. Is you're gonna get a lot of those for sure? There's another one with Andromeda. Yes. Nice captures. Nice, yeah. And, uh, oops, Please. sorry, that's not, that wasn't him. That was, this is Jeremiah, sorry. This is Jeremiah. See, I'm going too fast. Uh, Jeremiah said, the first photo, 10-minute exposure, ISO 1600, F4. I was surprised to see a faint hint of the California Nebula. I'm not sure where I'm seeing that. Boys, I hope we got these labeled right. Hmm. <laughs> uh. His second photo was the Pleiades. I do have that. That's down at the very. There. I yeah. think it was down at the bottom there. You see a little bit of red, a little slight red glow right down there. Yeah, right down here. Okay. I think that's in the right spot. Well, there's Andromeda up here, so it wouldn't be that. Yeah, but you, that you're kind of tilted off, so. Okay. That's a uh, fairly early evening, I think. Okay. I hope I haven't got his mixed up with Claude's shot. I might have. Anyway, there's Pleiades. I can tell that one for sure. It's gathering. I better not be coming up yet. I haven't had a summer yet. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's what I, that's what I commented back. Uh oh, I don't want to see that one yet. Yeah, well, that gets depressing when we start seeing that. It does for sure. <laughs> I know this one is. Uh, thanks, Jeremiah, for those. Uh, I know this one's yeah. from Deanna. 
Deanna Marathon King. She was above the trees the other night, uh, going uh, down behind our home in Keswick. Nice just, shot. Just a cell phone shot, she said. So, August 13th. Cool. Very nice. Great what cell phones can do now. Yeah, Mark yeah. Hecox sent this one in PEI just hovering over the horizon. Yes, sir. And we got this that's one. Not, that's not over the hood of a police car, by chance. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, this one we got from Bill Go. Bill uh, said, Sil a sliver of a moon near Chelton Beach in PEI. So very nice. Very nice. Yeah, well done. Those slivers are really nice. You can get those just after sunset. I went and found this one off of Robert's page. I do go in and steal uh, photos from fo folks every once yeah. in a while. Or borrow them. You had to bring them up. So this one from Robert, uh, the Cygnus area, showing the North American Nebula yeah. and around Deneb and the Butterfly Nebula around S Saturn. Sadar, I guess it is. Sadar, yeah. Sadar. Sadar. Right. Yeah. Tracked using a, a Skywatcher EQ6 Pro mount. There you go. And his t Canon T7i with a 50 millimeter lens. Exposure details ISO 800, F2.2, and uh, 106.2 seconds. No guiding, he says. Look at the stars. Eh? It's just, yeah, I mean, nice. it's, it's yeah. unbelievable the stars that are in that part of the sky. Oh. Billions of them. How many worlds are around all of them? That's the part I like to think about. Uh, yeah, this guy. Recognize that one? That was 2000. <laughs> That's back in yeah. 2008. So 2008, yeah. So this is Mike's shot of the moon from 2008. Taken with a webcam, actually. With a webcam. And here's Mike's new shot. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, a bit wow. of a difference. That was my comparison in, from 2008 to last year. Yeah. Or this year, June this year. Yeah, quite a difference. Amazing. Ten years, Mike's. Yeah, quite a pile of detail there. Amazing. Kathy it's, Adams put hers up too, and it's a, it's a, it is the same difference. It's amazing how how far people you know you come yeah. over a period of time. Yeah, lots of detail there. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, this one is nice from Matthew Dupre. Uh, he said he had Jupiter, Saturn, and star trails with an ISS pass. So here's his Jupiter shot, obviously. Excellent. Nice. Well done. Well Ooh, done. Hands, eh? Yeah. The vans. Yeah, crazy. Oh, the red spot, too. Red spot here, I think, yeah. Right here. Or, um, oh, you can see my mouse. I can't see. Oh, over here. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah, there it is, yeah. Yeah, it's upside down. That's right. Um, hang on a second. We got to put the next one. Here's some Saturn capture. Yes, so, sir. Oh, you got bands on Saturn, too. Look at that. Saturn, Five Saturn bands. Cassini division. And the Cassini. Yeah. Very nice. Saturn's got this nice view right now. The next In the next four years, we're, I mean, we're losing the view of the rings. By uh, 2025, that they're going to be basically disappeared totally. We'll just see a line going across. We won't get to yeah. see the rings like this. So we want to get out and enjoy it uh, this year for sure and uh, next year. But uh, very nice. Well done, Matthew. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, he yeah. got this one with the ISS going through. Uh, through sure, Saturn, the ISS. Saturn, That's cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. Very nice. Very nice. He said, I'd taken a few uh, these a few nights ago, and I turned my ASI 224 into an all-sky cam at the end of every night. It creates a time-lapse video and star trail image. So, well done. That's, That's cool. a good idea. Yeah. And he did send me uh, some info on uh, DIY and how to create your own uh, all-sky cam. So, I might put that up on the page uh, later on. I know you've done it, Mike. Yeah. I got this one captured by Mr. Owen. Yeah. Yes, sir. yeah. This was uh, a couple of nights ago. Yeah, that's that's an uh, incredible amount of data there and photo. Like that's just it blows oh. you away. Unreal. Yeah, that's um, uh, right now. The, the beauty of the Milky Way is, especially with Cygnus, it's pretty much overhead uh, when you look up. And and this is if if you're familiar with Cygnus, and it's, it's the Swan, so it's got the two arms, the two wings that stick out. So this is part of a um, uh, of a remnant uh, that was that a star that exploded some 8,000 years ago, and there's uh, a, what they call the, the the veil complex, and this is the western part of the veil, and you can tell the western part. Sometimes they call it the witch's broom because mm. it looks like a broom, right? Yeah, yeah. And but you can also always tell because it's got that um, that huge star right there. Yeah. And then of course there's the eastern veil, and then there's Pickering's triangle, which is right in the very center of it. So when you look at the whole complex. In a really really wide picture, you can see um, how, where the star would have basically exploded, and all this material gas right out, you know, just exploded out. Yeah. So that's what that is anyway. It's just uh, all hydrogen and uh, and uh, and oxygen. It's just amazing to look at. 
Oh, yeah. yeah. The I mean, detail even, on that yeah. is unbelievable. Even through the eyepiece, it looks nice. Like, I mean, you know, there's not a lot of things that look really nice. I mean, in Andromeda, they, they don't impress people. Andromeda, those type of objects, I guess, as much. But when you can see this, you don't, of course, yeah. make a detail like this or color, but it's still, you can get to see the shape of the witch's broom. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And when you I remember the what first time I saw that, we were at Fundy National. My, I think it was mm -hmm. one of my first star parties. Yeah. And I happened to have an oxygen three uh, yeah. filter with. Yeah. And uh, Adrian had that. Uh, I think it was the club scope. It's a sixteen inch. Uh, sixteen inch. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, yeah. Job, yeah. Yeah. So we had to get up on the mirror or up on the ladder on that. And anyway, he plunked in that um, that filter, and that's the first time that I saw the veil in a telescope. And I tell you something. You see it. You just you're not going to want to get off that oh. ladder. <laughs> yeah. 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 That was big ass, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. 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 Uh, Steve. Yeah. Oh, Steve's. Steve's that's cool. right. Yeah, Steve's. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that was the one. Yeah. Anyway, it was it was probably the, one of the nicest things I've ever observed in a telescope. Uh, was that? Well, that's what it looks like, only in black and white. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah. yeah exactly. You know, that's yeah. Cool. That was a detail you'd see. It's just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's very. It's it's bright. But with that filter, boys, it just jumps right out. It's unbelievable. Yeah. It's one of the prettiest things in the sky for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then we get this one from Renat. Um, oh, sir. Yeah, so, and I said to Renat uh, today, I said, she's the only person I know who can take a, who can get a photo of the night sky, doesn't matter what the conditions are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Weather-wise, it doesn't matter what the weather is like, she can always uh, drum us perfect. up a photo. So here's her, yes, here's her image, her, her uh, interpretation of uh, sunset near Back Bay behind the fog, she said. So, yeah. she does amazing work. i got to go down there. Um and get to her place because she's right on the water. She is. On the water, yeah. 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 And uh, I'm going to go down and visit and, and check that out because it's just amazing down there. Yeah, it is. I can see where she gets her inspiration. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I wanted to share this before we uh, sign off too because uh, Lisa's Look Up. Now, Lisa's uh, on Facebook uh, and she has a page called Lisa's Look Up and it's all related to astronomy as well. Um, and I'm sharing her chart here that she puts up on her page, and she has this one pinned, and it's what to look for for the re remainder of August. Um, of course, we've been through the Saturn and opposition now. Uh, the new moon has passed. We're, we passed the Crescent Moon and Venus uh, offering. Uh, Pierce Percy meter shower is still going on to the 26th of August, actually. But she puts uh, the events up here, and the, the cool thing about the chart that she makes up is that she lists the event, she lists the date, uh, the peak time for each one of those uh, things and then she says here in the, on the end seeing tools so we yeah. see a little set of eyeballs and that means you can see it naked eye if you have that uh, symbol there you've got the binoculars and of course the telescope so for instance saturn at opposition you want to use binoculars or a telescope and crescent moon and venus can be viewed with the eyes but you can also view it with binoculars and telescope but she has all three here listed for a lot of them so so i hats off to you lisa for for doing that that's yeah. something yeah, that's, well done. Uh, that's very well done um, first quarter moon now is uh, is actually tonight. Tonight, uh, yeah. Yeah, and tomorrow night we get the lunar straight wall. So that's that uh, 110 uh, kilometer long fault line on the moon that looks like a cliff, but it's only because of the way that the light is hitting that uh, wall. It's really just a very uh, shallow hill that you would walk down, basically. But the way the light hits that, it causes it to, to look like a, a long uh, fault line. So that's tomorrow night. Uh, the peak of the Cygnid meteor shower. Jupiter at opposition coming up on the 19th. Moon five and a half degrees below Jupiter on the 21st, the full moon, which is a, uh, another blue moon, which is, means it's the, the fourth full moon in the season. It doesn't mean that there's two in a month. It just means it's the fourth one in the season, and that's called a blue moon, and then the last quarter moon. So well, uh, well done, Lisa, for that. And here, if you want to follow Lisa, I, I highly recommend you follow her. She's at Lisa's Lookup, Astronomy and More, and you can find her at Facebook.com uh, slash Ruby Moonbeams, which is uh, excellent. <laughs> so thanks yeah. Lisa for that absolutely and uh, of course when you want to send in your photos you can send them into Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com we love getting your photos as you can see we love sharing them I make mix them up once in a while I do apologize for that <laughs> but I try to get them all in order um, anyway uh, that's where you can send the photos or just send them into the Facebook page as well we can uh, we can deal with them right there as well so thanks so much everybody for, for sharing those with us and I'm going to stop presenting here Great stuff. Okay, I guess we're awesome. about to wrap up. Yeah. We got no more questions here uh, that we see. Uh, just checking down through the questions on Facebook. I don't see much on YouTube. Uh, 
there we go. It looks like we're all good. Okay. Well, I guess we'll sign off. So, in closing, then again tonight, folks. Uh, thanks again for your. Uh, well, oh, this way. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so in closing tonight, thanks again for, for your continued support. Our special thanks again to Rosanna, of course, for her uh, contributions to our show. We really do appreciate all the work that you put into those. Very well. Thank you. Um, also, like to thank all those out there who share our program with, with everybody on Facebook and YouTube that, that, that get, get out there and get the word out for us, especially Trudy. Trudy's uh, our number one chair. So thank you, yeah. Trudy, again. Yeah. We really hey, do Trudy. appreciate that. Um, remember, too, we do love getting your photos, so send them into Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com, and we'll do our best to get them on the broadcast for you. Also, looking for topics for future shows. We're always looking for ideas for shows. This one came up because we just chatted about Milky Way and said, you know, it's a good time of year to shoot it, so this is what we brought up. But uh, So if you have anything that you'd like to share uh, or we'd like us to share with you, uh, you can send them into Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com, the same address, and we'll be happy to uh, try to get it on our broadcast. Also, uh, if you happen to join us from YouTube here tonight and uh, you enjoyed the content, please consider giving us a like and subscribing to our page, our, our site. And uh, please let your family and friends know as well that we are here every Sunday night to uh, entertain, educate. <laughs> it's kind of a toss, isn't it? It's kind of a, it's almost like some entertainment, some nights it's yeah, entertainment. <laughs> some, <laughs> it's kind of like, anyway, uh, to help educate and entertain you on the night sky. So for now then, everybody from Mike and Paul and I, uh, stay safe, everybody out there. Be careful. Uh, we wish you all clear skies, and we hope to see you again here next week. And as we like to say, guys, keep your scopes. Run it, it up. up. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And cue the music. Bubble hits. Thanks, everybody. There you go. <laughs> How did they know that was going to happen? <laughs> you have to have one. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Have a great week.